Hey, Margie here. So many of us are confused about the different testing options available for osteoporosis. And what about the bone density test? How often should you be getting it? And when you see a change in values, what really is significant? Well, we're gonna delve into this topic of osteoporosis testing with our very special guest, Dr. Felice Gersh. And Dr. Gersh is a multi-award-winning physician with dual board certifications in OBGYN and integrative medicine. She is the founder and director of the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine, a practice that provides comprehensive healthcare for women by combining the best evidence-based therapies from conventional, naturopathic, and holistic medicine. She taught obstetrics and gynecology at Keck USC School of Medicine for 12 years as an assistant clinical professor, where she received the highly coveted Outstanding Volunteer Clinical Faculty Award. She now serves as an affiliate faculty member at the Fellowship in Integrative Medicine through the University of Arizona School of Medicine, where she lectures. Dr. Gersh is the best-selling author of PCOS SOS and the PCOS SOS Fertility Fast Track. And she has published several articles in peer-reviewed medical journals. She is a prolific lecturer and has been featured in several films and documentary series. Her new book, A Menopause, is coming out in the fall of 2021. And in today's talk, we really go into the different testing of osteoporosis. And Dr. Gersh is really a wealth of knowledge. So stay tuned. Welcome, Dr. Gersh. I can't even tell you. I've been excited for a couple of days, but so happy. I woke up this morning and thinking, oh my gosh, I get to be with Dr. Gersh this morning. But you are so needed right now because first of all, May is National Osteoporosis Prevention Month. But that's besides the point. But you are you bring conventional medicine. You're an MD with unbelievable credentials. You have an integrative approach. So you really bring, bring the best of both words, worlds. And you have so much experience that I just can't wait. I always learn every time I talk to you. And I just oh. cannot wait to get this started and share your brilliance with everybody. So welcome. Oh, it's such a pleasure to join you. I'm so excited. I just love your podcast and all the information you spread throughout the world. Oh, thank you so much. So let's just get started. I, is there anything in your background that you wanted to share before we, before we begin that you think is important for people to know, to understand why you're so passionate about what you do and your work with bone health? Well, my own mom suffered so much from osteoporosis. It's, it's very personal for me. She had her ovaries removed. This is back in the day. And it's unfortunately, it still happens today. You wouldn't think so. But she had her ovaries removed in her early 40s because she had a benign ovarian cyst on one ovary. And they said, oh, well, it's okay. You don't need them because you're going to go through menopause in the next decade. So let's just take them out. And even I questioned it. I was quite young at the time, but I questioned it. And I said, what? they're not you know, cancerous. Why do you have to take out the other one too as well? And why do you have to take out the one with the cyst? Can't you take out the cyst? But that's what they did. And they didn't do anything for her afterwards. They didn't give her hormones. And so we know now that can go into a spiral of bone loss. And ultimately, yes, she had um, multiple fractures in her life and each one was so devastating. So it's, um, it's just such a prevalent problem for women. In her case, it was accelerated, unfortunately, uh, iatrogenically by her doctors. But even when it doesn't happen that way and it happens through natural menopause, you know, we know that women are so impacted by fractures, about half of women will have an osteoporotic fracture and 80% of the osteoporotic fractures are female owned. And uh, so it is a mission of mine. And the whole musculoskeletal system is so underrated in its importance in terms of quality of life in every aspect. So that's why I am on the mission with you to educate, inform and improve the lives of women who are all bone, <laughs> bone owners. We all have to take <laughs> care of this very valuable resource. 
Oh, I love that. And you, you've done so, so much and you just bring so many different worlds together and such a wealth of information. So because we could talk forever and you were on the podcast, it was over a year ago, actually. Mm -hmm. And what we didn't really, we just started to hit on and we really didn't hit upon. And I think it's important because what I see so much is that people find out they have a bone density test. They find out they have osteoporosis. And then the doctor was like, oh my gosh, you know, yes, vitamin D, calcium. They do tell them exercise mm -hmm. and go on medication. And, you know, that's your only option. And they really don't do a lot of testing to see what the root cause is. And you do extensive testing and really look at every possible aspect. So if you could share, unless you want to say anything before we get into the testing mm -hmm. that people need to know, maybe really explain to people what tests they need and what could really impact your bones that maybe you haven't been tested for. And before, does that make sense? Sure. So the conventional tests do have value, but like so many things, they have to be viewed in the context of what they're really capable of sharing and, and, and predicting. And a lot of tests that I think are very important are not even in the repertoire of most uh, rheumatologists or other people that deal specifically with osteoporosis. They're not even thinking about these kinds of tests. So the conventional tests would, which are, like I said, they have value, but they have limited value. It would be like the bone DEXA test. So that's a, a low, very low level radiation test. And it's typically done what we call a central DEXA, which would be looking at aspects of the spine and the hips. So because those are areas that are very seriously impacted when they're fractured. You can also do peripheral DEXA scans in looking at say the, the radius or the arm bone. That is another option. And it's interesting, they, they're changing them, but they're not very available now. As we know, we're in an obesity epidemic around the world and certainly in the US and the machines that were developed for doing bone de DEXA scans were not designed for significant obese women. And so that many of the ones that are out there, they wouldn't accommodate a woman who weighs more than say 300 pounds. And so the options are more limited than you can't do looking, uh, evaluating the spine and the hip, but you can still do the arm. And there are some machines now that go up to 400 pounds, but they're not always you know, available in, in all areas. So of course, then anyone who has that kind of an excessive weight has many issues to deal with as well as bone issues. And, and that's just as a comment, a lot of people think, oh, well, if you're really heavy, you're carrying all that weight on your bones, you're not gonna have osteoporosis. Uh, that's another myth because uh, people who carry a great deal of weight inevitably will have gut dysbiosis. They have chronic levels of inflammation, which is getting into other tests that we'll talk about. And inflammation is going to trigger a lot of osteoporosis as well, because osteoporosis involves the immune system very, very intently. That's really what it's all about. So, but um, bone densities are, are useful. The official recommendation is to start them at age 65. Now, the reason for that recommendation is that that's the age that is recommended to then start some of the pharmaceuticals like the bisphosphonates or the medications like prolia. Um, those are the, the age. They don't usually recommend them officially before the age of 65. Of course, we know that they're used quite readily in, in many women of ages, usually once they hit menopause. Sometimes I've seen them used in younger ages, which is um, not really recommended at all. But the reality is that if you want to be proactive, then I think you would want to see where you are with your bone density. And there you're, you're looking at really the, the matrix of the bone to see how strong it looks like looking at the, um, the calcification, okay? So you're not looking at the protein portion, you're looking at the calcification portion, and that is what shows up on an X-ray. And I think it's very valuable to get your first, like sort of your foundational DEXA scan, 
when you hit menopause or very early in the um, progression of the menopause. And why is that? Because many women actually enter menopause, sadly, with a very poor state of bone health. And that's a reflection of their previous life, you know, in terms of their diet, their exercise and fitness, and unfortunately, also often their choice of contraception and pregnancy issues. So the bottom line is that many women are shocked to find that they're only say 50, 51, and officially they already have osteoporosis. And it's like, how could I have osteoporosis? I've just barely entered menopause. So I liken it to when you, if someone hits retirement and then they look at their assets and say they have saved nothing their whole life. You know, they just, everything, every dollar that came in went out, you know? So there were really no savings. So you hit retirement age and you look at your bank account and it's like zero or close. And then you say, how could this be? I haven't spent anything. Well, not in retirement, but all your life, you didn't save. And that's kind of like with bone, you, you have to sort of, that's why osteoporosis prevention begins, you know, at birth. <laughs> you know, so we have to really plan for the future for our bone retirement, so to speak. You know, it's and funny then, though. I, lo I love that analogy. I use the same thing with bone <laughs> in terms of children exercising and you're building that bank account. So later on, yes. if you do lose some, you have more to draw from. But that's such a very good point because I know the American College, you know, the ACOG of gynecologists, of obstetricians and gynecologists, they recommend, you know, 65. That's so if you go to the gynecologist, they're going to say, well, those are our guidelines and that, you know, you don't need it before unless you have risk factors. But meanwhile, you could have lost 15 years if you of no of really having a barometer to just exactly like you said. So, and it's not that expensive and it's something that sometimes we have to ask for. The doctor may and, not order it. And the other thing is like, I'm glad you mentioned because the caveat is, well, if you have risk factors, <clears throat> then you can do it at an earlier age. So it's, you know, 65 and over for women who are in menopause, 70 for men. And earlier, it's like say age 50 to 65 with risk factors. So then what are the risk factors? I think every woman has risk factors. <laughs> so we can, we just, but most doctors aren't thinking of that. You know, they're thinking, well, you know, what do you mean by risk factors? You know, have you had, you know, some kind of genetic disease or something? You know, they're not, you know, they're thinking, oh, do you have multiple myeloma or, you know, something completely different than the fact that, well, you know, maybe part of your life as a woman, you had some restrictive eating, or maybe you had a sedentary lifestyle, maybe you were on birth control pills for 15 years, you know, there's all, you know, right through the, you know, right through your 20s, you know, they, oh, that's a, you know, a very common thing, women go on birth control pills in their teens, and then they go off of them in their early 30s, because that's when they want to start having kids. And basically, their bone building years were entirely, entirely, consumed with the hormones of birth control pills and not the hormones that a woman would normally make, which does change the ultimate outcome of bone. And so the, the doctors aren't even thinking of that as a risk factor. Um, sometimes- That's a good risk. point, because you're, you're one of the few people that really brings that up. It emphasizes, you know, what are we doing to our young girls that this can affect our bone? It's not something they all tell you if you're on birth no. control for many, many years, you know, this may impact your, your, you know, the amount of bone that you're building. So I, I think that's wonderful that yeah. you're sharing that information. So, but by, by thinking about that and everyone who's listening can think, hmm, well, maybe I actually do have some risk factors here. And then you can get it um, at an earlier age and then you'll get a baseline because I think knowledge is wonderful. I love testing that's non-invasive so that I have information to both educate and motivate and to also then help me to decide on a best treatment plan as well and how aggressive I should be or not be in, in different ways. <clears throat> so basically the bone density is the gold standard. You can't, there's no other test that is used to actually diagnose <clears throat> osteoporosis. <clears throat> so osteoporosis can only be officially diagnosed by a DEXA scan. And what's interesting is that the, um, the National Osteoporosis Foundation actually recommends that a bone density be performed even after a fracture. I mean, so it's sort of like, hmm, 
you had an osteoporotic fracture, why do you need a bone density? I think it's pretty obvious you have a problem here, you know, and, but they still recommend it as a sort of foundational way to look at those areas and, and get a baseline. So when you look at a bone density scan, a DEXA scan, what they um, get is two different types of scores. So this is like important because you have the T-score and you have the Z-score. And if for some reason, a premenopausal woman gets a bone density and there can be definitely reasons. So if that should happen, then the score that should be used is the Z-score because what you then doing is comparing yourself to other women your age. So that's, that's what the Z-score is, is looking like, well, how do you match other women your age? Now, say you are 70. <clears throat> Would you be excited to know that your bones look like a typical 70-year-old's bone? No, you would not. <laughs> so that is not what we're aiming for. So what we look at once you're postmenopausal and we do a bone density is looking at the T-score. The T-score is looking at the woman's bones like when she's at her peak bone density, like around age 30, some in that range. So then you wanna say, well, I'm 70 or 60 and I wanna know how do my bones compare with optimal bone, not like some other person's bad bones. <laughs> so I want to see, well, how do I compare to say a really spiffy 30 year old's bone? And that's what the T-score is. And so you show numbers that will show either consistency or deviation from that optimal number. And the more negative the number, the more, um, we'll say, disadvantaged you are compared with the bones of an optimal woman. So by definition, and this is purely by definition, and in fact, early, early on when this was all being decided, the definition was in dispute. Well, should the number be minus 2.0 or minus 2.5? Minus 2.5. And that should be the definition of osteoporosis. So after discussions, the ultimate um, consensus was to pick minus 2.5. So that would be two and a half standard deviations below the optimal bone density. So it's a minus score. So when you see a minus, that means that your score is below the optimal. If you should happen to see a plus score, that means your score is better. Now in the spine, that can be kind of tricky because sometimes it says, oh, you have a plus and you say, yay, I have the best bones. My, my spine is better than a 30 year old spine. Well, actually that is often not true because you can get like bone spurs, you know? So it's a whole different thing. Instead of the bone being dense, it's actually putting out little spurs and, and it looks, they can't read it properly on the bone density. And it gives an illusion <clears throat> of being denser. So that is not really, that's a, that's a problem. So we have to really be able to interpret the score as well. And um, so that's important to know. But when you have a score that's a larger negative, <clears throat> a larger negative number than minus 2.5, then officially, when you hit minus 2.5 and, and below, or greater number in the negative world, then you officially are designated as a woman with osteoporosis. Now, when you have a score that is less than minus 2.5, but it is a greater negative than the one, then you are labeled as osteopenia. And that's been actually disputed now, like is osteopenia a thing or is osteopenia not a thing? You know, like, because sometimes women with so-called osteopenia are treated with pharmaceuticals and that is typically not really a, an appropriate thing. But, and also women become very fearful when they see that they have osteopenia. So it's really important to know that there's actually no significant correlation between having osteopenia and even osteoporosis is sort of borderline-ish and actually having fractures. So it's like, if you're looking at predictability, like, well, what, what is the point, you know? So for me, the point is to try to understand bone health and then make appropriate decisions. But in the standard medical arena, it really isn't so much about well, how's your actual bone health and what can we do? It's really, what's your risk of a fracture? 
And they're actually not the same. I mean, they sound sort of similar, but they're not exactly the same. It's a sort of little different way of thinking of things. So, but if you're thinking of, well, what's the predictive value for developing a fracture, there is actually very little to none. <laughs> That's the thing is that you can have osteopenia and someone else doesn't. That doesn't mean that you're actually much more likely to get a fracture because fractures are a relationship to so many other things. Predominantly, did you fall down? <laughs> so, you know, so there's a lot of things that go into falling down. For example, what's your muscle state? What's your flexibility, your balance, your eyesight, your judgment, you know, and so forth. And so there's so much that goes into falling down or not falling down. And that's really the determinant of whether you break a bone when you have osteopenia. For women with very severe osteoporosis involving their spine, they can have fractures without falling down. When it comes to fracturing the hip, uh, except for people who have been on bisphosphonate, it's a whole unique situation. The only way you break your hip typically with a very rare exceptions would be that you fell down, but you can actually have a compression fracture involving your spine without actually falling down, typically by lifting something. And then you put these pressures and distorted, you know, uh, forces into the, into the spinal column. And then you get a, a fracture because the, the, the bone is so fragile and so weak at that point when that happens. And that usually, if you look at someone who has that type of a compression fracture and you look at their bone density, it's going to be a really large negative number. You know, like often like minus four something, minus five something, you know, when you're getting into, into that range, a much more severe state. So when a woman has a bone density of like minus 2.56 or something, you know, just barely. So it's not a time, it's really not a time to freak out, okay? You know, and think, you know, I'm doomed. It's, it's not, you're not doomed. And we definitely can do, um, do a lot to still help because once again, at that level, it's not about anything but falling down. So if we can keep you from falling down, you're not gonna break any bones. And many women who have significant osteoporosis, if they don't fall down, they actually don't get a fracture. And women with, you know, very minimal, bone loss can have a fracture if they just fall. And I've had patients who did things that maybe they took risks they shouldn't have taken. Like they'll, they'll start trying to do twirls on ice skates that they haven't <laughs> done, which they haven't done in like 50 years. And then they fall and get, you know, spiral fractures and have problems with healing and such. So the bone density is foundational. So I think every woman should get a bone density test done when she's early in, like within the first five years of her menopause. And then depending on it, it's not a test that you have to repeat on a really frequent basis. I think that's really important. And the other thing that's really interesting is that they always recommend that you do the test at the same site on the same machine. Now that already tells you something about the test, right? They say, well, make sure you get it at the same site on the same machine. That's because it's not that reliable. I mean, you have to know that it's not incredibly reliable when you jump from one machine to another, it's not that standardized. So that you can, and this has happened where someone will go and then the test is worse or better, but if we're talking about by less than say 5%, and, you know, a change and they get all riled up and the doctor says, oh my gosh, your bones are getting worse. We better do something. And it's like, it's not even statistically valid. Okay. First of all, even on the same machine, that kind of change, when you're only talking about like a 5% change, and by the way, on the DEXA scan report, they're going, you don't have to figure this out. You don't have to do math. <laughs> you know, it will tell you what percentage change there was from the previous one. So you don't, that'll say, you know, is a change of, you know, it's down by 5%, 6%, 8%, or it's up by this or that. But recognize that the quality of the test determines the significance that you should put with the change. And it turns out that anything less than a 5% change in any direction is probably not statistically meaningful. So don't think that that is, oh, my bones got 4% worse. Well, that's meaningless. Okay, so next, next story. So, but, and if you move from one machine to another, then we're not even sure what that means. So it, it's just, you know, take I it forward. I have to interject forward. here for a minute <laughs> because this is such a problem. You totally hit it on the head because I see so many people 
and their hip might be up, you know, less than 5%, but their spine is less. And the doctor's like, oh, your spine, you're really losing. And, you know, you have to go on medication immediately. Oh. I see this all the time. And the other thing I wanted to ask you about is the technicians, because there's different uh -huh. training in these DEXA technicians and how you position the patient can totally determine what their values are. So I didn't know if you see yeah. that in your practice or what people should there, you know, if there are certain trainings, I know there's different trainings that people should check out really when they're choosing a, you know, where they're getting their DEXA from, who's, you know, who's actually positioning them. Yeah, that's very true because um, a lot of radiology centers, they just buy a DEXA scan machine. And then often the people who operate it are the mammographers, you know, and then, you know, because, but they have great training in doing mammograms and they know exactly how to position the patient, how to do everything, but they have very limited training in, in the bone density. Um, arena. And so, yeah, you can, you know, if you think that you're looking through a certain angle, so the angle that you are putting the, the beams through can, can change the interpretation. That's why I always look at these bone density reports with a grain of salt, you know, because, you know, it's giving me a ballpark number. That's why I don't get, I don't get into these really like oh, it's up or down by this percent a little bit. It's just telling me, and that's why there is, by the way, there are some now experts in the field who say, get one and done. They say, just do one, because that's going to tell you sort of where you are. And then it's not going to really change your ultimate outcome or prognosis if you just keep repeating it. And or, uh, the, even the intervals of how often to repeat it are, you know, they're disputable, you know, because it's, once you get to a certain point, unless you have a severe bone disease, like say you have hyperparathyroidism, it's not just age-related menopause, which is its own unique thing, but you have something else going on. Like you have Graves' disease, hyperthyroidism, hyperparathyroidism. These are conditions where you can have very accelerated bone loss. It's a very, it's a different thing than age-related and menopause-related. So, you know, then it would make sense to get a bone density on a much more frequent basis to see what's going on. But for, for menopause, it is really um, questionable how often you should get it. But I think for the average woman, and it's very, it should be individualized and also based on emotions of the woman and what she feels. But, you know, you really don't have to, to do it, um, you know, like even less than more frequently than every five years in most cases. Um, now, if someone says, well, I really want to see if they're on some kind of drug treatment, I want to see the results, is it helping? Um, you can, but recognize too, and I'm you know, not a huge fan of the pharmaceutical treatments. And I'll tell you, the, the, real, uh, the main reasons I'm not a big fan is number one, there is no exit strategy. Literally, there is no exit strategy. Once the drugs are started, like they, they cannot be used indefinitely because they all change the whole dynamics, you know, this is like for a different day, but and I'm sure you've talked about this a lot. They change the whole dynamics of bone turnover and, and bone health and the whole way that bone works in the body. And it, so it changes it. So you can't just be on them forever. And like with the bisphosphonates, they call, they call it a drug holiday, which I think is an absurd way of talking about it. Um, Cause it makes it sound like we're all having fun when really, if you stay on the drug, you're doing harm. And so uh, I don't know about this holiday thing, but the <laughs> bottom line is like, if you start these drugs and say you start them um, according to real guidelines, say at age 65, where you know many people are put on, women are put on them much younger, but say they follow guidelines, they start them at age 65. Well, what if you're planning on living to hundred? So you're not supposed to be on them forever. And the bisphosphonates you need to get off in five to seven years. So what's the strategy when you get off of them? What are you supposed to do? There is really no exit strategy at all. And they do, um, you know, I call them among the, the drugs that are a bit of crazy makers that they actually can promote the very conditions they're designed to treat by changing the bone into more fragile bone because you're not replacing the bone in the appropriate manner. But the, the bottom line is that um, a lot of times when people do go on these medications and there can be um, uses that are very appropriate, you know, it's just not, it's not, it shouldn't be for everyone for sure. But when um, they follow them and they look at bone density, 
they really are not that useful in a way because they really don't build bone. They're designed to help prevent further bone loss. So it's, it's not really that helpful. And it's like, oh, I'm trying to grow bone. It's really not your, they're not really bone growers. And um, they make bone denser because the, the ability to remove bone becomes impaired. But um, so some of it, some people do like to follow people who are on these pharmaceuticals more closely to see you know, what's happening with the bone, predominantly to see that there's not continued loss as opposed to, to you know, that you're gonna have building bone and getting better bone. Um, but I think at least we want to get at a bare minimum a foundational baseline DEXA to see like basically it's sort of taking, you know, stock of what's your bone, um, you know, your bone storage that you've created all your life, you know, what's your, um, you know, what you've built up into your bone supply. And then later on in life, you know, for sure, every five or, you know, more years, but, and then in special cases, you could do it every other year. Rarely is it indicated to do it every year. That is unusual that it would be very helpful to do a bone density on a yearly basis, recognizing especially how inaccurate the test is. <laughs> so so it, it actually leads people down um, the wrong path into thinking things they shouldn't even be thinking. Um, so, you know, that's a lot about bone density, but they One quick are- One question for you oh. though, before you finish, before we move on from this. So the person who just finds out that, you know, they have osteoporosis, they've never been tested, they're in their fifties, and maybe they haven't been exercising and they've been eating a, you know, not a bone, well, not a diet that's conducive to bone building. So now they're going to do all these great things, which, which, you know, both you and I support, at that, what point would that person, would you test that person who's never done these good habits and, and they're now making major changes? I know that we have other tests you're going to talk about as well, but what, you know, that person, when would you recommend just approximately that person who's now going to be doing all these positive things for themselves? When would you recommend that they be tested again? Probably three years. Okay. I know it seems like, whoa, I have to wait so long, but, but there are other ways that we can know right. that they're getting healthier, you know? So it's not like we're going to do no testing. Right. It's just recognizing the real limitations. I wish that it were better. I wish that the bone density, the DEXA test was a better test than it is, but it is what it is. It has tremendous limitations and it's not so fine tuned that you could just follow it on a really close basis and really, really know that good things or bad things are happening. Unless like I said, you have a special type of disease, unfortunately, which really eats up your bones really fast. But you know, for these other things, it's just um, not, not gonna be that helpful because you'll misinterpret a lot of the data that comes out of it. I'm sure and, everyone's um, going crazy here because this is what everyone hangs on to. Like, oh no, you know, the bone, that's the full determinant. So this is so helpful. So keep going, okay. <laughs> well, and then sometimes people go to health fairs and there are, the peripheral DEXAs, you know, that may look at someone's wrist or they may look at someone's heel. And those are screening tools that are still helpful. So if you're like at a health fair and they're offering that, don't think that, oh, you know, it's really bad. It's not bad. It's just not, you, you cannot diagnose osteoporosis with these peripheral scans, but they're still useful as a screening tool. Um, predominantly if it shows something bad, you know, so then you you know, for sure you want to go get a bone density and then really think about your bones. If it came out really good, it doesn't necessarily tell you exactly what's going on in the femur neck, you know, which is the most vulnerable area of the, of the, the femur, you know, in the thigh bone, but it's still a good sign. And there are also some ultrasounds out there now, and I hope that they'll perfect ultrasound more in a lot of different ways for breast imaging, for bone imaging, because it's um, no radiation at all. Although I just want to mention in terms of the bone DEXA scan that the radiation is really low, that you would get actually more radiation, or so they say, I haven't measured it, you know, if you took a, a trip of an airplane trip, say from the bottom to the top of the coast on either coast, you would get more radiation from that plane trip than from getting the, the DEXA scan. So presumably that's true, but it's a very, very low radiation. In fact, um, when they do it, they, the people who do it, not that they aren't because they're usually doing a lot of other things, but it's not even required 
to um, do um, like lead walls in the walls of DEXA scan rooms. I mean, it's such a low dose of radiation. Usually they are because they're in radiation centers, radiology centers where everything is leaded anyway, but, um, and everyone wears, you know, little monitors and such, but it's really, really low. So for people, and I'm one of them who have radiation aversion, you know, so it's, it is important to know that. And then there are these screening tools with um, ultrasound as well looking at like the heel and such. And so if you're at a health fair or something, or you know your doctor has these in their office, you know they're still good. So I would not uh, discourage anyone from, from using those, recognizing that they're not for diagnosing osteoporosis, but just as a general screen. And um, in terms of other types of, of scans, they're not used usually except in research studies, but you can do CAT scans of looking at, at the bones, but the radiation dose for a CAT scan is so much higher. So they usually don't do that except as part of um, some kind of a research study where they they want to you know do something a little bit more thorough with a CAT scan. But CAT scan as a screening tool would be ridiculously high radiation and cost. So that would not be on really anybody's radar. And um, bone scans would not be used just in case you're thinking, well, what about a bone scan? Bone scan is a nuclear scan where you're injected with a nuclear material and it would accumulate in areas of the bone that had abnormal metabolism or like a cancer in a bone, like something where metastases in a bone or multiple myeloma and such. So we don't do that in case you know, just so that you know what we don't do as well as what we, we, what we do do. And in terms of blood tests, um, we don't, in terms of direct tests for bone, we don't have any, but I'll talk about my favorite tests that look at, well, I'll call it affiliated issues with bone health. And then in terms of urine tests, we have the NTX test, which is looking at a uh, breakdown products of collagen type one. And it's sort of the unique collagen type that's in bone. And if the bone is breaking down, then this particular fragment will actually, the N-telepeptide, they call it, will actually be excreted in the urine in higher amounts. And so what they compare it to, it's, so it's a urine specimen obtained usually like the second urine in the morning, and they compare it to what a person in the reproductive age group would be having as far as um, the amount in their urine. And if you had an amount that was one and a half to two times greater than what would be seen in you know, a, a reproductive age healthy person, then that's considered as potentially your bone is breaking down at a faster rate. And that's why this is now being excreted in the urine. Now, this is very useful for those other conditions that I mentioned where you have like Graves disease, hyperthyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, um, multiple myeloma, other you know, conditions of the bone where you have really potentially very rapid breakdown. Now in menopausal women, it, it can be used, but it's not as useful as it is in those other types of, of groups. But still, if you got a test and it showed a really high number, that would be of course worrisome if you had a really high number. If you don't have a really high number, it doesn't mean you're in such great shape though, unfortunately, because it's a little different process in terms of um, monitoring the bone loss in, in this particular group, menopausal women. So, um, and it's a little bit different sort of disordered bone metabolic health. So it doesn't show up. So it's not um, a test that's routinely done in menopausal women, but it certainly can be done. But you just, like every test, you have to be able to interpret it properly. So if you have a really high number, that would be alarming, of course. But if it's not a really high number, that doesn't guarantee you much of anything. That's the problem. And so, you know, it's, you just have to take it for what it's, for what it's worth. And um, if, especially if you have a family history of early onset of fractures, you know, and not because like my mom, her ovaries were removed, you know, at an early age, you know, but it's some other thing that is potentially replicated in you, then maybe you want to go ahead and do it. And then if you have those other conditions, if you do have um, issues with hyperthyroid, and we know Graves disease happens in a lot of women, then you really do want to be on board with getting these tests and really seeing what's going on in your bones. 
And, um, and it can be followed over time, you know, to see if, and people do um, like, especially like rheumatologists who are treating with the bisphosphonates or prolia, they will often like get a baseline with the, um, the NTX and then do follow-ups to see if, if, based on if it was high to see if it's going down. If it's already not high, what's the point? It's not gonna, it's already not high. But you know, if it were high by chance, um, and sometimes it is, then you know, at least you can see where it's going. And they do that as well in people who have you know, metastatic breast cancer, all kinds of other things where you have really a rapid bone loss problem. So, and in terms of like the basic screening test, that's pretty much where we are. But that's really, um, well, say the conventional approach. Then we have what I would say is the integrative approach where we see bone as part of the whole body system workings. And we understand that menopause, which is very much a risk factor for bone loss and osteoporosis and fractures is a, a state of inflammation. Now, one of the things that is not always well understood is the incredible connection between the immune system and bone. In fact, when you really think about it, where are all the immune cells, you know, most of the immune cells created, many of them are in the bone marrow. And the bone cells that actually make up bone, their progenitor cells, their origins, their stem cells are all in the bone marrow. So the cells that ultimately become the osteoblast, the osteocytes, the osteoclasts, all these key players in bone turnover, bone metabolism, bone health, they all are originating in the bone marrow. Now in the bone marrow come many, many of the white blood cells that populate you know, the peripheral blood and so forth. So there's this connection between the immune system and bone health. And when you have conditions that are pro-inflammatory, you will have a pro-osteoporotic inducing situation. And this is like, so conditions that are inflammatory, like a lot of people don't realize like rheumatoid arthritis, which is very prevalent, unfortunately, in menopausal women is associated with osteoporosis risk, much higher osteoporosis risk. And that's considered an inflammatory state. It's also associated with other sequela of inflammation, like cardiovascular disease, because all these systems are interlinked and the immune system is sort of like the connecting glue between all these different systems of the body. So if you look at the state of the immune system and the state of inflammation in the female body, it will give you a very good clue as to whether this woman is at significant risk for osteoporosis. So you wanna look for autoimmune diseases and these are not like routinely done, but you, know, you wanna check like what's her anti-nuclear antibody status, her ANA, like, and if she has any joint pain, which is so common, then you do want to get rheumatoid factor. You want to get what's called CCP. So you want to check and you don't want to wait until they're really clinically advanced. So this is the conventional medical world. We don't do proactive testing. In fact, a lot of insurances don't want to do proactive testing. If you, you, know, you have to have some reason, but most of the time you can do symptoms as your diagnostic reason, because it doesn't have to be the official disease state that you can get covered you know, with the testing for insur by insurance. If you have the symptoms, that is also very applicable and, and useful. So in the conventional world, it's like, well, when you have a disease state that's really affecting your quality of life, then we'll start giving you some drug treatment. But in my world, I wanna know things before they become really severe, like even preclinical states. Like, so if you're already creating autoimmunity in your body and you have a positive ANA, you have like positive thyroid antibodies, you have a positive rheumatoid factor and so on. I wanna know that before it becomes severely clinically manifested because these are things that I can actually reverse. I know that that's not thought to be true, but it is true. It is absolutely true that you can reverse early autoimmunity. Now, are you going to deal, are you gonna reverse late stage lupus? No. 
late stage rheumatoid arthritis. No, you have to get on these things early, just like late stage diabetes is not reversible, but early stage is. I mean, so why not reverse it? But you can't reverse something you don't even know exists. So I want to get this testing. I want to know what the immune status is because these are incredibly linked to everything, including bone health and osteoporosis risk. And I want to get inflammation markers because if, um, if I know that there's a high state of inflammation ongoing in the female's body, then I know she's at significant risk because once you understand that osteoporosis is an inflammatory process and that is, and so many people think it's like old bones because it's wear and tear. No, it is not wear and tear. I mean, if you get hit by a truck, you're gonna have broken bones at any age, but that's not what osteoporosis fractures are, are about at all. It's really about the immune system creating um, resorption at an inappropriate level in a pro-inflammatory environment. So it's very inflammatory within the bone and the osteoclasts are, are um, over, they're doing it. And it's also now understood that the osteoblasts are also coming from the, the bone marrow and have sort of a very strong connectivity to the immune system. So osteoblasts are not separate from the immune system. They're actually very connected to the immune system. And in menopause, the osteoblasts are also not working properly. So it's not just an overactive set of osteoclasts, it's actually also an underactive set of osteoblasts. And you have this imbalance, it's all you know complicated between you know, the rank and the rankle and the ligands and the OPG and all this stuff we can talk about other times, but it's all sort of in a dysfunctional state and because it's all related to immune dysfunction. I mean, that's really a takeaway. So you wanna look at the, the, you wanna see what the inflammation markers are. And then once you know that, you know, we're dealing with a situation of hyperactive inflammation, which really becomes, um, endemic in women in menopause who aren't on physiologic hormone replacement. And even if they're on hormone, it's not like you get your 25 year old ovaries back. You know, we're still, it's still a battle because we're not making things the same like you're 25, it's not possible. And so we, we have to do the best we can. And the reality is that there's so much we can do to lower inflammation in the body. By lowering the global state of inflammation, we're going to lower the risk of osteoporosis. And this is such an overlooked factor. So we have to do an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. And that means getting all the proper nutrients in so that the cell machinery can run properly, proper sleep, fitness status, stress control, which is, you know, and, and having purpose and happiness and love in life, of course, because nothing is so bad for bones like chronic stress and high continuous levels of cortisol, right? That's why we do not like prednisone to be given to people for endless periods of time. So, but all of these things are doable and they're not being done. I mean, this whole area of healthcare is ignored. And when women are shown to have like lower than wished for bone density, the reflex reaction is so often jumped to the pharmaceuticals. And that, is not the reflex that I would have. It would be, okay, let's look at what's going on from the immune state, the inflammatory state. And that's linked to all these other things, right? Because we know that if you have impaired gut barrier, if you have a dysbiotic gut microbiome, you will have inflammation because the endotoxins from inside the gut lumen are gonna pass through between the, the enterocyte cells and into the area where all those immune cells are residing around the gut. And they're going to become very hyper stimulated and release their inflammatory cytokines. And you're also not gonna make the proper short chain fatty acids, which then bind like the butyrate short chain fatty acid, you know, which is a metabolic byproduct of fermentation of the gut microbes should bind to the vagus nerve to increase parasympathetic tone so that we're calm and peaceful and can sleep. And none of that's gonna happen. And our livers are gonna be all inflamed because they're not gonna get the proper signaling from the short chain fatty acids. But we can actually do a great deal with diet by adding in these magical polyphenols, antioxidants and the fibers and all of that can to have such an immense benefit. And we now know there's data with giving phytoestrogen foods, which have been so maligned, you know, which I have to defend them. You know, phytoestrogens are good for people. You know, that would be like flax seeds and of course, whole organic soy. And there's so many foods that have polyphenols that are not even recognized as having um, 
phytoestrogen type relationships like quercetin, resveratrol. A lot of times um, the, um, the, the, the polyphenols that come from pomegranates, which have always been so extolled, you know, they're all estrogen related um, phytoestrogens, you know, so they're actually beneficial, but they're not going to stimulate cancer. They actually tend to lower cancer risk. So we have to think about um, the benefits of food and how it can actually help. And then of course, we need to have proper protein. As we age, our protein needs really increase. And there's some interesting studies, and I'm not a vegan and I don't advocate for veganism, but there are some interesting studies that suggest that plant-based proteins may actually be more beneficial for bone than animal proteins. But I like a balance but um, not overdoing the animal proteins for so many reasons like sustainability of the planet. But, um, but you know, by getting these really high quality proteins are so, so important for, for bone health along with all the nutrients, the polyphenols and all the, the vitamins and minerals, of course. So many minerals are critically important. So taking a multi-mineral supplement so you get like something of everything because I think just about every mineral has some role in bone and bone is so amazing. People don't realize that bone has so many functions, including being the storage site for the phosphates and the, the calcium to maintain the proper levels in the blood. So it's just a fascinating, it's like one of the most fascinating structures. It's so, so underappreciated. That's why I'm so excited that, you know, you are getting bone education out there because, you know, bone is uh, an endocrine organ. Bone makes a hormone you know, osteocalcin that actually helps regulate glucose metabolism. You know, bone is involved in the immune system. Bone, bone is like amazing in so many ways. You know, we couldn't, we couldn't survive without our bones. Of course, then we'd be jellyfish. But, oh my know, goodness. But... Yeah. <laughs> There's so much you, I, you know, we're going to have to have you back or we're going to have to, you and I figure out what we can get out to the world. Cause we could both talk for hours and you have so much amazing information and you're seeing results. You're seeing results with your approach, which I think is so exciting for everybody to listen that there is another way and it's, and you're, you're treating the whole person. So besides your bones getting better, everything gets better. And I think that's exactly. the beauty of it. Your eczema clears up, you're more relaxed, your whole life gets better. So it's always like, I always tell people there's something good. You know, there's a silver lining when you find this out early, like you're well, suggesting that all of a sudden you can, you know, it gives you an opportunity to look into your body and see where you can improve. And so how can oh. people, what I love, because the last time you were on the podcast, you had to be a resident of California or you had to visit Dr. Gersh once before you could see them. But with COVID, something amazing, some silver lining has happened that you can actually work with people all over now. Correct? Well, that may not last for long. At but, least for now, but, yes. But for the moment. And um, the, the nice thing is that even if you have to come see me once a year, it's in a lovely place by <laughs> Laguna Beach and Newport Beach and Los Angeles. So, you know, you can make like just a fun weekend out of it. But um, I would love to do in person. I can do telemedicine visits. And I have a, my office is in sunny Southern California in Irvine, California. And um, this is what I do primarily. I am a... Um, old fashioned doc, you know, and I see patients and I work with them and I personalize their care so that everyone gets the unique approach that they need because we're not, we're not cookie cutters of one another. So yeah, I don't have like, this is like the standard protocol, everybody get in line and follow it because we do come from genetic differences, nutritional backgrounds, ethnic differences, and, and personal desires that may not match everyone else's. So yeah, uh, we do personalize the care for everyone. And um, so it's a very old fashioned, sort of a, a resurrection of old fashioned care, which kind of fell by the wayside as protocols and uh, sort of the cookie cutter approach sort of took over. So we um, like the precision personalized care approach. Which is just so amazing. I'll have everything in the show notes. Do you want to give a number or any your website now here? I mean, I'll well, put it also in the in the show notes, but well, my practice is called Integrative Medical Group of Irvine. And it also could be found through my name, Dr. Felice Gersh. And I do an Instagram most every week. 
And I would love for people to follow me on Instagram. I try to cover just interesting topics and I just talk for a few minutes, so it won't take up too much of your time. And that um, handle is dr. Period Felice Gersh. So Dr. with dr. Period Felice Gersh. And please sign up and follow me on Instagram so that I know I'm talking to someone besides myself. <laughs> and that is fun <laughs> because it's fun because this is my, my mission is to try to... Um, to change lives, you know, as much as I can. I know I can't see everyone in my office, so I like to distribute information. I have um, a book that will be coming out. It'll be finished very shortly in, in later this uh, in May, and it will probably be actually published in the early fall. I don't have a title for it yet, but it is going to be all about various aspects and what to face as you enter the perimenopause and the menopause with some suggestions for what to do as well. So it's not all doom and gloom. And um, so I hope you'll look for my book down the road. It'll be coming out in a few months. Oh my goodness, I didn't know. I love your book on PCOS. That's absolutely amazing. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited. This is new to me. Oh, well, we'll keep in touch, Dr. Gershon. We're gonna see, <laughs> okay. I will let everyone know what great things we have out there, but you've given us so much information and so much hope. That's what I love. And for people to know there's another way and that they can contact you and have someone, you know, with your amazing background to really, you know, to just help them out that you're an amazing resource. So, and you're accessible. So thank you. I, I can't I thank am. you enough. And I love being with you. I love your energy and your enthusiasm. It's so apparent well. that you care so much and you really care about spreading this information to protect people so they can live their best lives. And you do a great job of that. So thank you. Oh, well, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me on. I hope you've enjoyed my interview with Dr. Gersh as much as I have. And now have a better understanding of how to look at bone health and these diagnostic tests from an integrative approach. All the links to Dr. Gersh's website and to connect with her will be in the show notes. So bye for now. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode.